I'm really glad you're here. Uh, my first job, anybody know what my first job was besides my wife? Or my kids? My first job was bagging groceries at my dad's grocery store. I, uh, I bagged groceries for about a year. I think he paid me less than minimum wage. I don't remember. He's not here to defend himself this morning. Uh, I, I don't remember what I made, but that was my first job. My first um, uh, above minimum wage job, so I worked at a couple of food places. Uh, my first job um, that wasn't uh, like a food place, but I made more than uh, minimum wage, was at Concentra Managed Care. Anybody, anybody know what that is? It's an insurance claims company. And I got that job uh, while I was in uh, Bible school because uh, anybody remember, if you've been around Grace, uh, as long as I've been around Grace, the Murrays, Micah Murray and Josh Murray, or the uh, uh, the Pettits, Jason and Glory Pettit, uh, uh, Glory Trosper now, um, their mom got me that job. Uh, I was uh, engaged. Actually, I got the job, and then I got engaged that day, wasn't it? We cel- I told her we were celebrating getting the job, and then I got engaged. Um, and I worked at that job for three years, all through Bible school. And then uh, once I got out of Bible school, my first youth ministry job, I was uh, a youth leader at Trinity Church, uh, the church we came from prior to here. And uh, uh, another church, the church from New Mexico, called uh, Trinity and you know asked if they had uh, any people that they would recommend, and, and Pastor Tim uh, recommended Crystal and I, and so um, we started our, our full-time ministry journey in Hobbs, New Mexico, because uh, they called Trinity, and, and Tim recommended us. I, I'm sharing these stories with you uh, this morning uh, very quickly to, to show you that along the way, somebody has helped us. When we came to Grace Community Church, it was because uh, uh, Josh and Micah and uh, Jason and Glory and the Gums, Joe and Lexi Gum, uh, wanted us to come and be the youth pastors here. And they called, uh, they talked to Eric and Susan, and then Eric and Susan talked to us. And, and this whole uh, kind of convoluted thing, we ended up here, uh, but it wasn't because we came and we applied for this job. Now, there are some of your stories would be you've had to scratch and claw for everything you've ever got in your life. But many of us would say there are portions in our life, if we were honest, and we took a step back, that there were people who helped us get to where we were at, whatever those things are. And oftentimes, I think we forget about that. I think we forget those who helped us along the way, especially when we've been there for an extended period of time. We've been here, it'll be 15 years in August that we've been at Grace Community Church. I can't believe it's been that long. But we are here because of friends. I mean, I, I'm, I'm removing the spiritual side of this. Yes, Jesus Christ is sovereign Lord and, and the Holy Spirit orchestrated all of that. Okay, so uh, that's the foundation for all that, I'm, that all that I'm talking about. But beyond that, we're here because of friends who connected us with Pastor Eric and Susan. I'm the senior pastor today. Yes, the Lord orchestrated it. But because Eric and Susan poured into us. And when, when the time came... And, and David and Diane Coffey talked to Pastor Eric and Pastor Susan. They, they would have spoken highly of us. I'm not here today of my own, just because of my own merit. I would be arrogant to tell you I'm the best guy for this job. I'm here today because people have helped me along the way. I get to go to... Uh, Cubs opening day on Thursday. It happens to be here in Texas. Uh, But I get to go to Cubs opening day today because somebody wanted to help us get there. I don't know if I'm allowed to say names, so I'm not going to. But somebody came to me and, and said, we want to bless you. We want to help you fulfill this dream that's in your, and I, I wasn't like whining and complaining. I was, the Lord orchestrated somebody helping us get there. Little things like that. When, when uh, uh, Christmas was rolling around, Crystal wanted to buy uh, tickets so that we could uh, get to opening day. She knew the Cubs were going to be here. I told her we couldn't do it because we were not going to be spending money on those kinds of things. And then the Lord 
heard her prayer. I didn't even pray for it, honestly. I just let it go. She prayed that somebody would bless us. And somehow the Lord would come through. And he did. And we get to go to opening day on, on Thursday. And I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. This morning's message is about helping others. Uh, if you're a Cowboys fan, here's a, here's a transition, right? If you're a Cowboys fan, you might be a Tony Romo fan. I, I don't know if you are or you aren't. Uh, you may be a Dak Prescott fan. He's the current quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Tony Romo is viewed as a better quarterback, and here's the language that sports people will say. He could throw people open. Now, what does that mean? People run the same route. Tony Romo could throw it to the place that nobody else would have a, a chance to get it, and Dak is supposedly unable to throw people open. So he's not as good a quarterback. I'm not, I'm not making these uh, uh, statements about him. I'm repeating them. People are leaving now because they're cow- – <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, there are receivers who make quarterbacks look really good because their catch radius is bigger. And, and our receivers have been dinged because supposedly unless it hits them right in the chest, they can't catch the ball. And so they go out and they find receivers whose catch radius, they can catch it here and they, they can catch it over here so that if a quarterback can't throw you open, maybe they can still get a catch. All of this is about fac- facilitating something. All of this is about understanding I can't do this thing on my own. And so a really great quarterback, who's the best quarterbacks ever, wherever they threw the ball, somebody's going to catch it, right? But is it the quarterback or is it the receiver? Or is it the line that's blocking and giving them all the time in the world to throw the ball? I think there's so much that transpires in our lives that are a direct result of somebody else. And we, we don't take a step back and recognize, wow, I am in the dream that the Lord has given me because somebody else has done something to help me get there. A few weeks ago, I shared with you about epic fails in the Bible. And I shared with you about uh, John Mark, who abandoned the mission. I shared with you about Jonah, who really just didn't love people. I shared with you about Mary, who uh, was demon-possessed. I shared with you about Peter, who denied the Lord. I shared with you about the woman at the well, who had been divorced multiple times and was living with somebody. And all of those people were restored because of repentance, and God used them to do incredible things. Their life was not defined by a failure. I also told about David. David was an adulterer. He was a murderer. At times he was arrogant about how great a king he was, how great of a a military man he was. And yet God used him in a mighty way and in multiple mighty ways because he humbled himself, because he repented, because he followed after the Lord. We read about David in Acts chapter 13 where it says he was a man after God's own heart. So as a reminder for you this morning, our failures are not the end. They're opportunities to learn and move forward. Our failures can paralyze us and keep us where we're at, cause us to become stuck, or they can propel us to the dreams that the Lord has for us. I'm starting here today because I needed to remind you of David's failure and yet show you how amazing God was in continuing to use him after his mistakes. Because remember, he slept with Bathsheba. He killed her husband. That baby died. But then she became pregnant again. And I don't know that uh, many of us have put together that Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon, the, the wisest man ever to be born. His mom is Bathsheba. So they obviously continued in relationship. I want to I stop there for a second, and I want to come back to Solomon. But before we go to Solomon, there are so many things that transpires in David's life. And one of those things is there's peace in Jerusalem. Now, it was a rare thing for there to be peace in Jerusalem. But there's peace in Jerusalem, and David decides he wants to go get the presence of God and bring it back to Jerusalem. 
Now, this is, a, this is an important thing because it's important to understand that you and I, if you have made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and if you haven't, today would be a really great day to do that. And we can have that conversation when we get closer to the end of service. But you and I, we have the opportunity to talk with Jesus on a moment-by-moment basis. We have the Holy Spirit that resides within us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So to talk about the presence of God, to talk about the relationship with the Lord, is very mundane for us. Because we, we do it on a day-to-day basis. But in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, before Jesus came, left heaven and came to this earth and lived a sinful perf- or a sinless perfect life before he died on the cross and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven there was no relationship with god in a moment by moment basis and so david understood that the presence of god the very presence of the lord resided in this box called the ark and it wasn't in jerusalem and he had a problem with that So David made the decision. He was going to go get the very presence of God and he was going to bring it back to Jerusalem because there was peace in Jerusalem. So David sets out to go get uh, the ark. Now there are rules and regulations for everything. If you read the Old Testament, if you've been following along with us, we've made it through. We've survived Leviticus and we've survived. uh, Actually, we're in the middle of Deuteronomy and we're getting all these rules again and... um, To move the ark, here were the rules. They had these gold loops that were on the side, and they had these long poles. And these long poles would go through these loops, and then four priests, one on each corner, would pick the ark up, and they would walk with it. And that was the rule. That was set up by the Lord. This is how my presence is going to be moved. Well, in this particular uh, instance, uh, David decided, because it was a long way, from where they were going to Jerusalem, that they built a brand new cart. And they, they put through the, the loops, uh, these wood poles, and they picked up the ark, and they set it on this cart, and they were going to let uh, an ox, a, a, a set of oxen pull the uh, ark to Jerusalem. Now, nothing inherently wrong with that. It's a long ways. I think they're trying to be real smart with their time and their energy, except it wasn't what the Lord wanted. That that inherently is a problem. (laughs) It says in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, and we're going to live in 1 Chronicles today. I know it's like your favorite book of the Bible. Um, We're going to live there today, so if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to 1 Chronicles. Uh, We're going to jump around in there. It says this in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 9. And then when they came to Kedon... Uh, Kedon's threshing floor, Uzzah, this is one of the priests, put his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. He struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died, therefore, before God. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but it took aside in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So they didn't obey. They changed the rules. Don't change God's rules. It's a really bad thing to do. They changed the rules. They decided they were going to do what was convenient. They decided that we were going to do it the way that they thought was best. Uzzah in doing the right thing. Now, I, 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 don't, I don't blame Uzzah. If the ark was about to fall over, I would try to stop it from falling too. It's a, it's a reaction. It's, it's natural. I don't want the presence of God to fall. But the presence of God would have never fall, fallen had they done things the way they were supposed to do it. And I don't blame the Lord for striking Uzzah because Scripture was clear. The rules were clear. The consequences were clear. Obedience is obedience. Changing what the Lord commands is never okay. 
And if anybody's wondering what our written command for today is, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's not negotiable. That wasn't negotiable. The call today is not negotiable. God hasn't changed. There is forgiveness, but we're fooling ourselves if we think we can change the written and spoken expectations of the Lord. Adjusting how the ark was going to be moved was innocent. It made sense, sense, and it was convenient. It was wrong, though. So Obed now is being blessed, right? Because the presence, uh, by the way, here's, a, here's, a, here's something you should grab hold of. Where the presence of the Lord is, is blessing. So I want the presence of the Lord in my life because I will be blessed and my family will be blessed and my home will be blessed. Where the presence of the Lord was in Obed-Edom's house, they were blessed. So three months later, David decides he's going to try this again. Except this time they're going to do it right. In 1 Chronicles chapter 15, it says this, verse 25. So David, the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy. Remember, he was fearful. We just read David was fearful of the presence of God. And now David and all of those that are with him are joyful. The presence of the Lord. Yes, we should fear. We should respect. We should have awe of the presence of God. But it should also bring joy to our lives that we have a relationship with God the Father. All sovereign, creator of heaven and earth. We have the privilege of walking on a moment-by-moment basis with the God in heaven. That should bring joy. And David understood that. Verse 26, And so it was when God helped the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant, now they're carrying it, and God's helping them. They offered seven bulls and seven rams. David was clothed with a, a robe of fine linen, as were all the Levites who bore the Ark, the singers and the ken. Kenenya, the Kenenya, I don't know, the music masters with the singers. David also wore a linen ephod. That's the prayer thing, in case anybody's wondering what the ephod is. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of the horn, with trumpets, and with cymbals, making music with stringed instruments and harps. And it happened as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the city of David that Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David whirling and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. So here's what just happened. David goes to get the ark in the presence of God. He brings it to Jerusalem, as he had set out to do originally, and this time it's with joy, and this time it's with offering, and this time it's with sacrifice, and this time it's with worship, and they're dancing, and they're praising the Lord, and they're, they're giving God all the glory, and, and David, who is the king, who's expected to be regal, who's expected to be proper, who's expected to be whatever you would put on leadership, which, by the way, you should never do. For me either. I need to be who God's called me to be. David was a worshiper from little. That's what he did in the field. He was a shepherd. He was writing songs and singing. He was reverting back to who he was. Who he was at his core. He's just worshiping the Lord. Well, David and uh, their lack of clothing apparently was uh, not dressed appropriately for that. He, he was not regal. He was not very kingly. And his wife, Saul's daughter, was embarrassed. In, in uh, the other version of this, in uh, uh, Kings, I believe, it says she was embarrassed by him because he had exposed himself to those who were around. David did not care about his own... Um, pride at that moment. He was about worshiping the Lord. And the presence of God is now in Jerusalem. In First Chronicles 16, you'll see that David blesses the people. They throw this incredible party where everybody gets food, like David is bringing out all of this food for everybody, and they begin to worship the Lord with exceeding joy. And by the way, can I just say thank you to our worship team Can I say thank you to anybody who helps with our worship team? That's actually the way we're supposed to be living our life. 
you've heard me say this before, um, this portion of our liturgy, me preaching, is not going to be in heaven. I'm not going to get to preach in heaven. In case anybody's wondering, uh, it ain't happening. When we get to heaven, the only part of what we've done today that we will be doing is the worship part. We're not going to be making announcements, talking about going to Cuba or a youth auction. We're not going to be receiving tithes and offering because the streets are made of gold. We're, we're not going to need any money. The only thing that we're doing today that we will actually be doing in heaven is worshiping the Lord. And David understood that. And he was teaching the people, this is what we're supposed to do. This is how we're supposed to do it. And not, I'm not going to just expect it. I'm going to model it. I will worship the Lord with all of my heart. I will dance like David danced. And, and the song that, that uh, I think it's Crowder wrote, Undignified, is all about that moment. And then David has this dream from the Lord. And this is, all of that portion of the message was free. Here we get to the real stuff. I'm going to move real quickly. David has this idea in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. Now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant, the Lord, is under tent curtains. Uh, they brought the ark, in case anybody doesn't know the history and how things worked in Israel, the, the tabernacle was basically a glorified tent. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, a, a temporary structure that could be moved with the children of Israel through the wilderness. It could be moved with the children of Israel when they went to battle. And so this glorified tent is now where the Ark of the Presence is. And David is realizing he's going to bed in this really nice house and the Lord's going to bed in a tent outside. And David kind of has a problem with that. Verse 2, And then Nathan said to David, Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, You shall not build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from, tab from one tabernacle to another. Let's skip down to verse 11. It says this, And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers. He's talking to David still that I will set up your seed after you who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it away from him who was before you. We're referencing Saul. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So David has this incredible moment where he's worshiping the Lord and the ark and the presence of God is now in Jerusalem and they've thrown this incredible party and we've, we've had a big worship like week, not a worship night, like a worship week where they're just hanging out and they're partying and they're worshiping Jesus. David goes to bed and he's like, something ain't right. I want to build God a house better than my house. And Nathan's like, yeah, that sounds good to me, the prophet. But then God speaks to the prophet and is like, uh-uh, it's not going to happen. Like, can you imagine what Nathan must have felt like? Uh, I just told him it was okay. And God's like, mm, sorry about you. <laughs> You're going to have to go back to him. So Nathan goes back. And he humbles himself and he tells David all of these things. And what does David do? Now remember, this is a dream that he has, that he believes is a God dream. A God-given dream to build God a house. He had this thought, the, the man of God, the prophet of God said yes and amen. So now it's not just my idea. It's confirmed by, by those who are in religious authority. God said, it's not for you. You're on the right path, but it's not for you. It's for your son. It's a God idea. It's a God dream, but it's for someone else. So what does David do? Does David pout? Does David complain? Does David quit? Does he give up? No. In fact, if you re re 
uh, read the remainder of 1 Chronicles 17, he gives incredible praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. David, again, failed. I mean, would you call that a failure? He had this idea, and then it wasn't, right? I mean, I, I don't really believe David failed in wanting to build the Lord a house. I don't want anybody to think that this morning. But how often do we think we have this dream and we have this direction and this is what we think we're supposed to do and then the Lord just tweaks it or changes it and now we've failed in some way. No. No, David models well what it's supposed to look like when we have this dream and we submit it to those who are in authority over us or, or we submit it to those who have the power to release or to, to keep us from stepping into that dream. David shows us what it's supposed to look like if it doesn't go exactly as we have planned. He didn't let it paralyze him. He didn't pull out on the idea. He praised, he processed, and then he began to develop the plan to propel the dream. And yes, those are all P words. David chose to facilitate, and that's the, that's the dream builder today. David begins to choose to facilitate the dream of the Lord in Solomon's life by orchestrating what would happen next. And we're going we're gonna to quickly move through what David does because really, you probably know, but I, wanna, I want you to see it in Scripture. I don't want to just tell it to you. David makes the decision, this is the dream of the Lord. I can't do it, but my son can. And by the way, it's irrelevant that it was his son. If you hear anything today about the only reason why David did this was because it was his son, you've completely missed the point of this message. The, the point of this message is, my dad got me a job. Bonnie got me a job. Josh and Micah helped get me a job. Pastor Eric helped get me a job. All along the way, people have helped facilitate the God-ordained, God-orchestrated things in my life. And I have to take just a step back and one, give thanks. And two, who am I supposed to be helping facilitate the God-given dreams? It doesn't mean I stop pastoring. It means while I'm pastoring, I help facilitate somebody else's dream. Too often we, we get all about us. So here's what David does. This is incredible to me. First Chronicles 22, 1 Chronicles 22.1. I'm going to read quickly. David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of burnt offering for Israel. So David commanded to gather the aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he appointed masons to cut hewn stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails of the doors and the gates and for the joints, and bronze in abundance beyond measure and cedar trees in abundance for the Sidonians and those from, by the way, I've been saying this word as a Tyree my entire life. It's not how you say this word. What? Nope. Turi. It's S, you would say it S-O-R-E-E. -E. Turi. I, I just, I've learned that this week. There you go. That's free for you this morning. For the Sidonians and those from Turi brought much cedar wood to David. Now David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and to the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious throughout all countries. I will now make preparation for it. So David made abundant preparations before his death. Then he called his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. David, David knew exactly exactly what the dream was because the Lord gave him the blueprints. David knew exactly what it was going to take, so he gathered the resources. And then David acknowledged that his son was young and inexperienced. Hey, guess what? Sometimes you've got to release people that aren't ready. And that's okay. But we help them. David kind of got him like this and said, here's what we're going to do. And he kind of helped him walk this way, and we're going to walk this way, and I've already got all the bricks you're going to need, and I already got all the, the money you're going to need, and I already got, I, he got it already. And then he says this in verse, in verse 17. David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon, his son. Now he's got all the other people. Everything started with gathering the resources, 
got his son, and now he's pausing from that, and he's saying, all right, everybody else, is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you rest on every side? He's, he's speaking to their, their personal situations. They are now living in peace in Jerusalem because of the Lord. And David is saying, remember this. Remember where we were at. Remember the fighting we've had. Remember everything that's transpired. And right now you're living in peace. For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Therefore arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy articles of God into the house that is to be built for the name of the Lord. He said he orchestrated the stuff. He got his son, and now he's orchestrating the people to help accomplish this dream. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 9 says this, And people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord, and King David also rejoiced greatly. The people were commanded. They didn't really have a choice. This is the king talking. But they gave of their stuff, they gave of their resources, they gave of their money, they gave of their time, not just because the king said to. Because if it was just because the king said to, I don't believe they would have rejoiced. They would have done it mumbling and grumbling. But when it was done, the people rejoiced. Why? Well, one, there was this beautiful structure that was for the Lord. But two... I believe they helped see the facilitation of somebody else's dream come to pass. And that is always worth giving God glory. David evaluated Solomon's ability. He evaluated his own resources. And then he engaged his authority, his finances, his natural resources, and set up Solomon for the future. We have to do that. This is a challenge this morning for you. I believe you're supposed to have a dream from the Lord and you're supposed to be engaging the dream. I've said it every week. We've, we've referenced in Acts where Peter is, is, is repeating what Joel said. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where, what stage of life you're in. Everybody's supposed to have dreams or visions from the Lord. But I also believe we're supposed to be helping facilitate somebody else's dreams. 20 years pass. David's dead. And we get to Second Chronicles 5 verse 1. So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he put them in the treasuries of the house of God. It took 20 years for that dream to be fulfilled. 20 years. And even after David's death, what's referenced? Solomon says, we're bringing in the stuff that David got ready for us. Who have you helped with their dream? And and your kids is part of it. Your grandkids is part of it. That's your first priority when helping other people's dreams. But I need help. I I don't know if you know that or not. I don't have this whole thing figured out. I'm kind of, I'm lucky to get one foot in front of the other most days. This pastoring thing is a lot. So much more than I ever... I'm going to go back to being a youth pastor. I want somebody else to do this portion of life, and I'll go back to doing that portion of life. I don't, I don't know how to parent a 21-year-old and a 3-year-old and two in between. I, honestly, I've never parented a 21-year-old before. I'm learning this thing on the fly. I need help. I have a dream for my kids. I'm dreaming that my daughter, I don't know if she's in the room or not. If she left, I can say her name. (laughs) I'm dreaming that Whitney is, and she is, I'm not suggesting she's not, will be a godly young woman who will serve the Lord all of her life and be committed to what the Lord has for her. Whatever that is, I want to help her get there. So I sit down and I have hard conversations with her. I have celebrations with her. I sit with my son. 
I'm not going to say his name because he's sitting right there, but that guy (laughs) right over there, that one. And I say, what are your goals, son? How can I help you get there? What, what, do you, what is next for you? And I, I look at the, the third kid right here in the red shirt that's giggling, hoping I say his name, because he doesn't have a job, and he doesn't have any money, so I'll say your name, Juan Juan, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan's a freshman in high school, and he's yet to figure out what's next. And I want to help him get to where he's supposed to be. That is a dream I have, is to help fulfill their dreams. But I also see Kara, who was in the youth group when we became when we came to youth became the youth pastors here, and I want to help fulfill their dreams. Javier, who we've gone on mission trips together and we've lived a lot of life together. We've had ups and downs. We've cried and we've celebrated. And everybody else in this room. Here's the deal: I can't do this alone, and neither can you. And if you think you can, you've badly misjudged your own abilities. I love you, but you're not that good. All right, I'm heading to the barn. I have these four questions. What is the dream the Lord's given you? Do you know what it is? Honestly, do you know what it is? And if you don't, ask him. What is the dream you're working towards right now? Because if you're just coasting, that's not okay. It's not. I don't see anywhere in Scripture where we get to coast. If you can find it, come tell me. I, I want to coast for a minute. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about striving. There's a difference. I'm not trying to earn my salvation. My salvation is secure. But nowhere do I see in Scripture do I get to just coast in this life. I'm always supposed to be loving God and loving people. And sometimes it's, it's a lot of things. Here's the next question. Whose dream are you helping to facilitate? Honestly, have you, have you thought about how you're going to help somebody else get to fulfill their dream? Now, you know what? I, here's a secret for you. If you've never done that before, I, I, I think there's more joy in seeing somebody else fulfill their dream than there is in even fulfilling your own dream. Because there's something to, God, you you gave me whatever the resources are. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes you actually have to just help pay for somebody else's dream. Don't be scared of that. Sometimes it's the, the skill set that God's given you. He, he got all the people who could cut the bricks because Solomon didn't know how to do that. So he got everybody who did, and they helped build the... Sometimes it's your skill sets. Sometimes it's your wisdom. Sometimes it's your love. And I just need somebody to be an encouragement. But there's some some significant joy that's deep within us that when we engage to help somebody else fulfill their goal, fulfill the dream that God's given, when we help facilitate that, oh man, there's fireworks going off and there's praise and you can't stop smiling and all... Whose dream are you helping to facilitate right now? How are you moving the ball down the field? I want to tell you something. You were never meant to be alone. It ain't anywhere in Scripture. Solomon, the wisest man ever, said, two are better than one, and a threefold cord is even better. He says that in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Matthew tells us where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst. I can I can pull a hundred Scriptures on unity and encouraging one another and We'll be here till next Sunday. But Erica's having a baby on Wednesday, and she wants me to end. I, I want to beg is a very strong word, but it may be the right word. I want to beg you. Throw somebody open. Go make a bad, a, a really difficult catch when you get a bad pass. It ain't all going to go the way you think it's supposed to go. And that doesn't mean you abandon. Sometimes you gotta, you got you to gotta roll up your pants. Oh, my God, I got decent socks on today. <laughs> and you got to wade into the water, and it's muddy, and it's ugly, and it's dirty, and you got that nasty junk in your toes. And 
because it didn't go how you thought it should go. I'm going in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing with you. And for just one quick sidebar, it's really hard when it's your family. Don't quit on them. They need you. They really, they do. They need you. They, you can't, they can't, they're not going to make it without you. Lord, I, I know you have incredible dreams in store for me, for my family. I also know you have incredible dreams in store for everybody in this room. And Lord, you care about the little things. That's why you decided to, to bless us with tickets to a baseball game. That really, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter, but brings joy. It brings joy to me and my wife. I'm grateful for that. I'm blessed by that. But Lord, you also care about the fact that you wanted me to be a pastor one day. And so for the last 21 years, you have been orchestrating the, the chess pieces of my life to get me to the place where I would be here this morning, encouraging others to help them see there are lots of people that they can help accomplish their dreams. Who's... Whose story are they going to be part of when they get up to share their testimony? Lord, I pray that we would be aware of what's happening around us and we would recognize our gifts and our talents are not just for us, they're for your kingdom. It's why you said in Hebrews that we are, we're supposed to gather so we can encourage one another. Lord, I pray that we would be encouraging our children. We would be encouraging uh, those who are ahead of us in life and those who are behind us in life to, to get to their dreams and accomplish them and we would be doing everything we can to help them. Lord, you've called us to facilitate. It's not just our dreams, it's other people's dreams as well. 